To counter China's growing military power, increasing resiliency of American forces and bases in the Indo-Pacific should be a priority for the Defense Department. That's according to Stacey Pettijohn. She's a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Stacey, nice to, meet, nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. What's the problem here? What makes the current U.S. military posture in the Indo-Pacific vulnerable? There are a few issues. Uh, the first one is that it's concentrated on a relatively small number of bases, which means that there are a lot of forces that are in proximity to one another, which makes them vulnerable. The threat, of course, is from Chinese ballistic and cruise missiles. Uh, Beijing has invested a lot of resources in developing a very robust arsenal of very accurate missiles that can hold it for at risk all U.S. forces in the region. Um, and bases, uh, because they don't move, they're fixed, uh, normally lots of concrete, uh, big buildings are easy targets. And the United States has been in a situation for the last uh, several decades since the end of the Cold War where it hasn't really had to worry about a threat to its bases in this way. And that's changing, not just in the Indo-Pacific. We saw this in, a, in Iraq too, in the Middle East with Iranian, the Iranian attack on al-Assad and um, Erbil. So you write that to increase the resiliency of the US military posture, the, the key is to distribute those forces across more locations and then putting in place a system of passive defenses. Explain that. Sure. So typically when we think of defenses, we think of active defenses. And these are systems that intercept an incoming threat or attack before it hits you. So you can think of the Patriot system or THAAD, which are surface-to-air missiles that are fired and will um, actually hit an incoming missile and protect you. But passive defenses are things that minimize the damage of attack um, by making you hard, uh, you know, hardening different facilities so they're less likely to cause damage. You distribute forces around so it's harder to hit them because they are spread out. So you can't, with one bomb armed with some munitions, um, take out a lot of aircraft or people um, with one shot. And so these steps uh, improve the ability of the target to absorb the strike, recover, and resume normal operations. So then if passive defenses are you know, more affordable, they're still effective, why haven't they been used more? There, there have been a number of uh, problems that have in, inhibited, um, I think, investments in this area, and a lot of them are somewhat political. From the services perspective, um, they're really sort of loath to invest a lot of resources in facilities and pouring concrete. Um, they prefer to spend the money on their priority weapon systems, aircraft, ships, tanks, or missiles. Um, and those are the things that are near and dear to them and uh, important. And the defenses just end up being at the bottom of the priority list and get chopped uh, repeatedly. You also see that Congress sometimes can be very reluctant about spending money on overseas bases. They'd rather invest money at home where um, they have their own constituencies. That seems to be changing a little bit. And hopefully, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative is one of those efforts where Congress really focuses it so that they do invest and make sure that the department makes the posture investments that are needed there. Well, the, the administration did release the uh, 2021 posture review. What do you think was missing from that? Um, I think there was a lot missing from that. It, it ended up being a process that I believe was intended to largely be corrective, that the department had found that a lot of the normal processes that it had in place to evaluate its posture had been discarded in the last administration. And then they wanted to reassure some of our allies like Germany, where the Trump administration had made promises uh, or uh, had indicated that it was going to withdraw a number of forces from there. And they wanted to reverse that. So it was really a corrective move in reestablishing processes so they could more uh, fully evaluate posture going forward. But in the end, they raised a lot of expectations and then didn't deliver much new. It was just sort of going back to the status quo. And I think that is why um, you saw allies and partners in the Pacific and some uh, defense policy watchers in the United States were disappointed with it. 
So when you say that uh, the U.S. should distribute bases more so that they're more defendable, um, what areas of the globe should the Pentagon prioritize for those military bases? What countries in, specific, in particular? Um, right now, I think in the, if you're looking at the Pacific, there are two countries that um, are prime candidates. The first one's Australia. Um, the AUKUS agreement with Australia, the UK, and the US uh, was focused on nuclear submarines. But um, in the long run, it's looking to increase integration of defense planning and to strengthen ties there. And it mentioned um, that uh, posture was one of the areas where that might um, happen. And the United States has talked about this with Australia for a long time, especially with respect to large aircraft, and it hasn't actually materialized. So I think that is one place where um, it, it would be advantageous from an, a military perspective and the politics are right. The other one is the Philippines. Um, we've been, the United States has been trying for a long time to um, gain access to some new facilities there, and they did with the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, but that kind of stalled out under Duterte with some of the um, tensions between the two countries. And that now you see that the relationship has been renewed. Um, they approved the visiting forces agreement, so they're allowing US forces to stay. And I think now is the time to actually begin to implement the EDECA and to make improvements to some of those facilities and to use them. These aren't permanent bases, but locations where US forces can temporarily go for exercises and um, different times. All right, well, Stacy, thanks very much for being on the program. Appreciate you being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.